All right, the uh, record reflect we are uh, back in session. Parties and council are present. All members of our jury and our alternates are present. And uh, people ready to call your next witness? Yes, Your Honor. People had asked to recall uh, Sergeant <coughs> Smith for a couple matters. Okay. Smith to connect to some of the stuff that uh, Sergeant Hankey testified to on Thursday. Do you recall him testifying to the nature of certain checks that were written through QuickBooks on or around the time of the mixed day disappearance? Yes. And are you familiar with uh, Sergeant Hankey's testimony regarding how certain things stood out to him, such as the backdating and the, the form of the checks? Yes. Okay. So as part of that, I'm going to show you, just for an example, exhibits 420D and E we saw with Detective Hankey. Are you familiar with those? Yes, I am. Okay. And how are you familiar with those? Uh, well, in addition to listening to Sergeant Hankey speak about them, I also reviewed and observed those checks. Okay. Put an object is foundationally on so, what was it, when you, in your review of those, what stood out as significant to you as to further study the investigation you took as to this subject matter? Objections to relevant and discovery. Oh, you turned away so much about half your question. Sorry. What was it about checks like this that Sergeant Hankey testified to that stood out to you um, that caused you to do some type of further investigation into this subject matter? Well, as Sergeant Hankey testified to, and as I observed as well, you see how uh, the payee on the top here over to the, uh, the left, Metro Sheet Metal, is in all lowercase. Um, also, the memo line is in all lowercase, and then it's also dated on the on the fourth. Same thing with the bottom check. Uh, that's also over to the left. You see the payee Charles Merritt is in all lowercase, as well as the memo is also in all lowercase. And it's also dated on the fourth. Did you have an opportunity to review the bank records for Earth Inspired Products on this account that were previously admitted in an evidentiary hearing? Yes, I did. Specifically, Exhibit 420. Sorry. I'm going to show you what's been marked as 420A, a subset of 420. Do you recognize those? Yes, I do. And how do you recognize those? Uh, these are the checks to uh, from Earth Inspired Products from the bank account. Okay. Are these meant to be all checks from that account? No. What are these specifically? These specific checks uh, are all the checks that were written to either Catherine Jarvis, Charles <laughs> Eric, or um, iDesign, which yep. is Charles' company. And is that during a specific time period? Correct. It, it covered the time period from uh, November 2008 all the way through uh, February 2010. Okay. And specifically, as an example, this is, for the record, 428 is a list of 54 documents as marked. <coughs> I'm going to show a couple for exemplar purposes. I'm going to start with the first page, check number 1010. Is this one of those checks? Yes, it is. Can you please describe it for us? Uh, so this is a check dated November 1st, 2008. It's uh, addressed to Catherine Jarvis. Um, the memo line says Chase SOS. Uh, and a couple things that I observed with this check is when Joseph wrote his checks, he would capitalize the C. You see the C capitalizing Catherine off to the left of the exhibit, as well as the J capitalized. When he wrote the money, um, 3,000, you see these are always lowercase from what I observed. Uh, and the memo, you also see how Chase is capitalized and then SOS is capitalized as well. And then 
the second page of that collection is check number 1026. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. Can you describe it for us? This is another check from the, the same bank account. It's dated uh, December 4th, 2008. And again, what I observed with this is you, all, you see pay to the order of cash. Um, you see it's capitalized. The money, 4000 is all lowercase. And in the memo, you see the memo I designed for you, which is the company associated with uh, this matter. I'm going to go seven pages back of the 54 to check 1041. You recognize that? Yes, I do. Can you describe it for us? <clears throat> this is a check written to iDesign. Uh, it's dated January 12, 2008, for 1500. Um, and in this check, you see how uh, showing off to the left, iDesign is capitalized. The memo um, that says Karen Dentistry. The K and the D are capitalized, and again in the pay E, or I'm sorry, um, in the pay line, it's 1500, and that's all lowercase. Now I'm going to randomly skip into this 54 pages just for an example. To way to the back door to check 1130 as a different exemplar. Can you please describe that one for us? Again, this is a check dated uh, July 10th, 2009. You see how Charles Merritt, the C and the M are capitalized, where it says 1100, that's all written in, in lowercase, and in the memo it says I design, that was also capitalized. Were there a few occasions in this 54 exemplars where a memo line was not included? Yes. Was it frequent? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was frequent. There are multiple checks that don't have a memo line in them at, at all. There's nothing written there um, in, in these series written to, to Charles. Okay, for example, the very last page, which would be number 54, page 54, check 1072. Would this be an example of one of those? Yes. So you, you see again, uh, Charles and Merritt, they're capitalized. Um, 500 is written in lowercase, but there's, there's no memo line on this one. So this is a check dated uh, October 27, 2009. Showing you what a subset of the original bank documents, 420, is 420B. Do you recognize that? <coughs> yes, I do. He is in what? And how do you recognize that? These are more of the checks from the account written to uh, Charles Murray. And does this cover a specific time period? This covers... Yes, it does. This time period is from uh, December 4th, 2009 through um, February 2nd, 2010. February 2nd? Correct. Okay. And again, as just some exemplars through here, I'm just going to go with the first page, 1093, a description of that for us, please. So again, this is a check written to Charles Merritt. You see uh, in the middle of the exhibit, Charles, the C is capitalized, Merritt, the M is capitalized. There's no uh, information on the memo line in this one. Uh, this is a check dated uh, December 4th, 2009. And again, you see 525, that's all lowercase. Skipping ahead to the second to last page of this exhibit, multi-page document exhibit, check 4152. Describe that for us, please. Uh, so this is one of the first printed checks that uh, Mr. Merritt received. It's check 4152, um, and it's a printed one, but you see his uh, Joseph's check writing pattern remains the same with a capital C, capital M, and Charles Merritt is in the memo line, although it's a little higher. Um, and then this one, when he did the payees, the first letter of the money denomination is capitalized, but then everything else is lowercase. And this is dated uh, January 22nd, 2003. Looking back to, sorry, strike that. <clears throat>
showing you what's been marked as 420C, another subset of the bank records of 420. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. How do you recognize it? These are checks that were written to Metro Sheet Metal. During which time period? Uh, these checks cover September of 2009 through February 1st, 2010. Are these all handwritten? Mm. I'd have to look through all of them. I know Joseph wrote both handwritten and typed checks to Metro Sheet Metal, so I don't know if all the those are all the handwritten ones or those are all the typed ones, but he wrote both to Metro Sheet Metal. Gotcha. So let's start just as an example. The first page, check number 1059. <laughs> Please describe this for us. This is a check to Metro Sheet Metal. It's dated September 30th, 2009. Again, you see how, uh, kind of in the center, off to the left of the exhibit, Metro Sheet Metal Incorporated. The first letter is capitalized. Um, 2200, those are all written in lowercase. And then in every Metro Sheet Metal check but one, uh, in the memo line, Joseph wrote the job that was being completed. Um, in this one, you see found the fabrication. So he wrote the purpose. I guess his uh, job would be a misstatement. I'm going to ruin the surprise for you, but I'm going to turn back into this stack of documents to check number 41. Looks like 45. Is this one of the typewritten checks you remember reviewing? Yes, it is. Okay. Can you describe it for us? So this check is dated January 4, 2010. Again, you see how Metro Sheet Metal Every, the first letter of every word is capitalized in the um, denomination line, one, the 1,353, the one is capitalized. And here you see in the memo line, in addition to having the address of Metro Sheet Metal, um, it says Desert Springs Final Balance. So he, he denoted what job it was for. And I'm sorry, the significance of why there's an address for Metro Sheet Metal? It's just included in the memo line. And in that case, Metro Sheet Metal is properly capitalized in both the payee as well as the, um, the subpart down here? Correct. So I want to go back to 4145 for a second. I'm going to try to split screen this a little bit. Probably have to zoom out. Leave that at, at the top, and I'm going to juxtapose it with 420D. The one we heard from Detective Hanky. You see the distinction I was pointing to between the Metro Sheet Metal listed here and the Metro Sheet Metal listed there? Correct. The address um, where you see Metro Sheet Metal is all lowercase as opposed to the top check uh, Metro Sheet Metal is properly capitalized at each word and the address is there. We heard some testimony with uh, Detective Hanke on cross-examination about whether or not he was aware certain phone calls were placed in juxtaposition to uh, certain QuickBooks activities. Do you recall that? I do. Uh, did you have a chance to double check the work of Detective DeGaulle and inspect um, Mr. McStay's T-Mobile phone or phone account for voicemail messages. Yes, I reviewed uh, all of the messages left on Justice Home. Did you find any from the defendant? No. Did you have a chance to look for during those phone records for the last call made to Joseph from the defendant's phone? Sorry, from defendant's phone to Joseph's phone number. Like ever? <clears throat> Is that what we're talking about, or on the fourth? Uh, I think it, well, ever seems awful, but in the records we have, I'm sorry, let, let me backtrack. Are you familiar with the records that are obtained from AT&T that they've heard testimony from the custodian of records on? You're familiar with those records? Yes, I am. And what is the ending date of those records? Uh, February 19, 2010. Do you know why? Uh, he switched carriers. And in looking at those records, were you able to ascertain 
the approximate time and date of the last phone call to Joseph's phone? Yes, the last day uh, Mr. Merrick called Joseph's phone was on February 9th. I'd have to look at the records to get you the exact time. No phone calls after February 9th, to your recollection? Correct, on those records. Nothing further. Pause. Uh, yeah, first, uh, all this stuff about the checks and the lower case, you deduced that those were written by possibly somebody else? Correct, I did not believe Joseph wrote those checks. So did you get that from the fact that Merritt admitted in his interview that the jury's all heard that he wrote those checks? Objection assumes facts not in evidence, mistakes testimony. That evidence is in, uh, that statement is in evidence. My understanding is Mr. Merritt admitted to receiving checks on the 4th, uh, not writing them. I'd have to review whatever transcript you're talking about. Did you review the check details for inspired products since 2006 that were collected by Detective Hankey? The bank records that I received from Merchant Fire Products started in 2008, so I did not review prior to 2008. I didn't say bank records. I said, well, that Hanky received a QuickBook record that he took a screenshot of, <coughs> right? Correct. Testimony, almost 1,000 pages. Correct. Did you review the check detail pages, 92 pages of it? No, I did not review the QuickBooks. I reviewed the banks. Would you be surprised to learn that all the memos are written in lowercase by Joseph? Objection. Assumes facts not in evidence, lacks foundation, and speculation. <laughs> so you didn't review that either? I didn't review the QuickBooks, I reviewed the banks. Now, you said you checked the messages on Joseph's phone, correct? Yes, sir. And did not do Gall testify <laughs> that it appeared that all the messages started on the 15th and the other ones were deleted? Correct, that is my belief as well. So at the last call, from my client to Joseph McStay's phone, on, according to the records, was the night. That would be before the first phone call after the other messages were deleted. Yes, the night is before the two. So are you surprised that you did not find any messages from my client after the 15th? The the call on the 9th was odd to me that your client made to Joseph, but I'm not surprised that there were no calls from Mr. Merritt after the 15th because I believe they were all deleted. Now, you reviewed the phone records for Joseph McStay, right? <coughs> Yes, sir. And the last activity on his phone was on February 4th at 8.28 p.m. Yes, sir. No other activity? Nope. No checking of voicemail? Not by him. And you heard the testimony of T-Mobile, uh, custodian <coughs> records that say only another T-Mobile subscriber can get into a phone records and delete them. Right? Objection misstates his testimony and calls for speculation. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I asked that particular question. I'm going to object, Your Honor, to counsel yeah, arguing the, with the, the court. The objection is sustained. Move to strike counsel's comments. Well, I'd like to be heard, Your Honor. No, it's not up to this witness to review and summarize other witnesses' testimony. Isn't it true only a T-Mobile customer could have deleted those messages that were missing? I don't believe that to be true. You don't believe it? Did you work for T-Mobile? Objection, argumentative. Sustained. Did you ever work for T-Mobile? Objection, argumentative, not relevant. Sustained. Do you have any evidence that supports your belief that only the more than T-Mobile people can delete phone messages? I have personal experience from checking voicemails and having a phone since 2000 that you can call from any line, and as long as you have the PIN, you can enter the phone. But that's as far as my experience would go with that. You have T-Mobile? No, I don't think I have T-Mobile.
And the last call from my client's phone to Joseph McStay's phone was February 9th. For two minutes. And that was the same date that he was on the phone with Brian Baker? Yes, Mr. Baker was there. And that was the same day he went down to see Susan Blake? Correct. And that's the same day he went to the house and realized Something's wrong. They're not here. Objection. Calls for speculation. <laughs> the same day he went down to the house and found nobody at the house. Yes. Objection. Calls for speculation and assumes facts on evidence. Yes, according to Mr. Merritt, that's when he went down. And that's the same day Susan Blake testified that my client was telling him we should probably call the police. And she said, let's. Give him a couple days. Objection. This states Ms. Blake's testimony. Again, she's saying that it's not up to this witness to summarize the testimony of other witnesses. Objection. Calls for speculation. Objection. Calls for speculation. Objection. Calls for speculation. Objection. Calls for speculation. Thank you, Your Honor. People call Donald Jones this year. I do. State your full name and spell it for the record. My name is Donald Thomas Jones. D-O-N-A-L-D-P-H-O-M-A-S-J-O-N-E-S. Thank you. While I become extremely jealous, tell me what you currently do for a living, please. I'm currently retired. Mostly retired. Okay. For about... Not quite four and a half years. Okay. What did you retire from? I was a criminalist in the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department Crime Laboratory. Started working in October 6th of 1980 and retired October 17th of 2014. And how long did you serve as a criminalist? About 34 years. So what year did you start as a criminalist? 1980. Can you please describe for us your educational background? Yes, sir. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry from the California State University at Northridge. I also attended courses in the Master's Program of Criminalistics at the California State University of Los Angeles. However, I did not obtain a Master's degree in Criminalistics. And I do have a Master's degree in Biology from the California State University of San Bernardino. So in terms of formal education, that would cover it. Okay. What is a criminalist? A criminalist is... Another term is forensic scientist. A person who is trained in the natural sciences and applies those natural sciences to the analysis of evidence in criminal matters. During your 34 years as a criminalist, did you have a particular focus at all? Or did you, at various points, have different specialties? I would say at various points I had different specialties. When I first started working with the crime laboratory, I primarily did crime scene investigation, forensic alcohol analysis, and controlled substance analysis. I did a little bit of toxicology and a little bit of what's called trace analysis, which is kind of a catch-all phrase to say that occasionally I looked at shoe prints or what we call physical matches, other things like that. I then was transferred into a unit, a serology unit, which is the identification and characterization of biological fluids. And I kind of focused in there for a while until about 1989, 1990. 
I was asked to, with another analyst, uh, receive training and uh, with the intention of setting up our DNA program in the crime laboratory. I'd say about that time I became more focused as a, uh, as a DNA analyst, um, received training from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, went back there for about, about a three and a half to four week class. Uh, my partner, his name is Dan Gregonis, and I came back, and it took us about not quite a year and a half to set up, uh, validate our procedures, set up our program, establish protocols, and, and, and so forth, uh, establish a population database for using the type of DNA analysis we were doing at that time. Uh, since that time, our lab has progressed through various DNA technologies uh, to the one which is uh, primarily being used uh, today in the lab. And uh, what is that? The current technology? Yes. It's called uh, analysis of short tandem repeats. Um, it has to do with looking at areas of the DNA that have small repeating patterns that are generally found in areas of the DNA that don't code for uh, biological molecules such as proteins that are, that are used. It's kind of in a, some people call it spacer DNA, some people call it junk DNA. It's in the in-between regions. When did that technology first come into use, at least in our county? In our county, right about the year 2000. Um, and actually, at, at the year, right at the time we were starting to develop it and, 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 and move it, I actually took a hiatus from the DNA work. I went into, uh, I guess I would call it lab management for a period of time. I was the quality assurance officer for about four and a half years, um, from 2000 to about 2004, 2005. And then I promoted to being a supervisor uh, in the lab and I supervised the forensic biology unit, uh, and then I sent, sent, uh, supervised the, uh, the firearms unit, and then I supervised the control substances forensic alcohol unit. And after about five years, I realized that while I could do the work of laboratory management or administrator type, I was a scientist at heart, and I asked to be demoted to go back to the analytical bench. So in 2009, um, I took a voluntary demotion, went back to being a DNA analyst, was uh, went through training with the, the SDR process, which was currently being used in our laboratory, and started DNA casework until the day of my retirement. When you say DNA casework, well, SDR is short tandem repeats. Yes, sir. Probably use that SDR, it's easier to say. Um, <clears throat> Can you describe for us, you mentioned your formal education as far as school and degrees, kind of in your, in your FBI experience with regard to DNA in the 80s. What other training and background do you have in uh, analyzing DNA? Well, with regard to DNA in general. Or with regard to DNA in general. With regard to DNA in general, aside from the uh, extensive training I had with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. There were several uh, workshops and training classes that were put on in the state of California, uh, either by the what's called the California Criminalistics Institute. It was a private company called the Serological Research Institute, and there were. Uh, workshops put on, sponsored by the California Association of Criminalists, which is a professional organization I belong to. And all of these dealt with different aspects or different, uh, either the application of or the development of uh, DNA-related techniques and how to incorporate them into the uh, current, current systems we were using in the laboratory. Along with that, uh, during that period of time, uh, there came a number of uh, regulation, um, I think what the 
the best word for uh, guidelines, uh, one of which was simply accreditation of crime laboratories. Uh, our crime lab initially became accredited in 1995, and then the Federal Bureau of Investigation put out a, uh, a DNA quality assurance document, which was a set of guidelines on how DNA should be applied, uh, which was uh, an important standard to, to maintain because it then allowed DNA typing and results in one laboratory to be confidently compared to typing results that went on in other laboratories. And this allowed for a, uh, a database that then could be shared among user laboratories. And we, we were involved in, in that. So there was training on, on how to <coughs> implement these documents. There was training on how to audit other laboratories that uh, had, in, um, had implemented these and they were required to have certain audits every now and then. So that we also went through that type of training. Um, so when you say that type of training, that type of training is in how to become accredited and how to perform audits on other laboratories? Sure some that of that is. is. And, that, and that involves an understanding of, of, uh, of protocols, uh, how to look at, at protocols, what certain things do, and so forth, uh, and make an evaluation of them. And so we were, as a lab, we were audited by other laboratories, and members of our laboratory audited other laboratories. Did you participate in those? Numerous times, yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> anything else with regards to spe specifically DNA in general? I know it's a long, long period of time. <laughs> uh, there was, it, it, well, it was, it's required that you had a certain amount of, I guess we would call it, uh, continuing education uh, type of, of, of training. Uh, when I went back, to the uh, to the bench when I took my voluntary motion to go back to doing to being a DNA analyst, uh, I attended a number of courses put on by the California Criminalistics Institute, which um, basically involved the the use of the short tandem repeats, the use of the, the technologies, the new use of some of the kits, commercially available kits that were available, um, and. Then we also kept up, kept up uh, looking at literature resources, literature uh, sites on studies that had been done. And these were all um, basically had to be documented by our either our DNA technical leader or by our quality assurance officer. You mentioned you were a quality assurance officer. What's a, what's a technical leader? Uh, a technical leader uh, is, is actually defines a position defined by the DNA quality assurance document. Uh, and they are responsible for the, the, the implementation of your procedures, the validations, of making sure people are proficiency tested. Um, it's pretty much responsible for the overall running of the DNA program. They're the, they're the person that has the, the power, if you will, to, to shut the program down if, if, if an issue comes up. Uh, and then it, it needs to be explored prior to being putting the, the technology back online. Uh, and this is again to protect the integrity of the data that is produced by the laboratory. Um, you mentioned these standards for quality assurance. Uh, in your field, do you, do you think those are important? Yes, I do. At, at, at times, some of, the, some of the standards might be a little overbearing. Um, the standards that are put out by the FBI with regard to the quality assurance of DNA typing, I think, is, uh, are, are to the point. There were some standards that were put out by the accreditation um, the body that we were switching to right about the time I retired. Um, and they had some uh, some policies, procedures, some thought processes that I thought were not in line with what drew me to the field, what drew me to the field of forensic sciences. In fact, in, in my opinion, they were not based in science. They were based in something else, making a better business and, and so forth. 
Um, and so at that time, it was it was time for me to, to retire. The field was off to go in a different direction. Um, there's a there's a function I think that is important for forensic scientists, and that is called critical thinking. The ability to apply your your education and your experience at the bench level for the good of the from the bench analyst and was being displaced to either the technical leader or to, to other areas. Um, and it just it, it was a philosophical difference that I had. So it was it was time for me to retire. The field is going to do fine. Uh, the, the work is going to be going to be fine. It's just that what drew me to the field, this this uh, ability to at the bench level apply my my education and my experience and so forth uh, was being minimized uh, to the point where I thought it's time to hand off the baton. You mean just in general in the field? That's correct. Not your personal, right? That's correct. Okay. In general in the field. Okay. Well, I think we put the cart before the horse. Let's back up a little bit and talk about what is DNA. And I'm going to show you, put up on the screen, Exhibit B, 62, <coughs> 61. Sorry, what, what exhibit? 861. 8. Can you tell us what we're looking at here and what is DNA? Uh, yes, I can. Um, is, is it all right if I could get off the window sure. stand? It's just hard to turn around and look at, look at it here. DNA is a, a term that's short for a longer term called deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, it has been called the, the blueprint of life. DNA is the, uh, the substance we have in our bodies which allows the body or the cells to generate proteins which then start the biological processes that we have. It is also the genetically inherited material that is passed on from generation to generation. DNA can be found in several can be found in your, your blood, although it's not found in the red blood cell, because it's really it's housed in a nucleus in a cell, and red blood cells don't have a nucleus. It's the white blood cells that are in your blood that contain the DNA. Sperm cells. Well, these are the cells that are then uh, kind of key in terms of the inheritance process being passed from one generation to the other. Some extent in saliva, and it's really from the sloughed off buccal cells from the in interior lining of your mouth. <coughs> in hair, uh, primarily it's the roots of the hair that have the what we call nuclear DNA, nuclear meaning that it's found in the nucleus of the, of the cell. In tissue, such as your skin, uh, that, that is actually very rich in DNA. Uh, sometimes the, the outer layer of skin may be anucleated. It doesn't serve as much a, a function, but the deeper, deeper tissues, uh, deeper layers, will then have a lot of DNA in them. DNA is also present in bone. It's, it's harder to get to, but it can be done. It can be extracted out of that. Uh, the same going for, for teeth. And it's there in a, a kind of a very low amount in urine. Uh, again, it would be coming from the inside of the, uh, of the canal uh, through which urine passes. Each of these, basically we're talking about has cellular uh, material that is present. And if we take a look at a, a typical human cell, it has a number of compartments inside the cell. It has a mitochondria, it has uh, ribosomes, it has what's called an endoplasmic reticulum, but it also has a nucleus, and it's inside the nucleus where the DNA is housed. And the DNA stays in there for protection. It is a, it's a key thing with regard to survival of an organism, and therefore it needs an extra wall of protection. So each human cell has an outside membrane, and it's also a nuclear membrane which protects the DNA. The DNA itself is a long chain of what are called nucleic acids that are, are bound together. And then they are wrapped up around proteins in a uh, 
structure called a chromosome. When you unwind the chromosome and get rid of the, of the proteins and stretch it out, you get kind of a twisted ladder type of uh, structure. And in the ladder, you have rungs of the ladder. And these rungs of the ladder are made up by pairs of nucleic acids. And as it is, there really are only four types of these nucleic acids. There's adenosine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And we simply call them A, T, G, and C. And when you, <coughs> when you take a look at the structure of DNA, these rungs or these uh, pairs, <coughs> excuse me, it always winds up that an A is always paired with a T. And the G is always paired with a C. So that if I were to take this DNA and rip it down the middle, basically unzip it, and only have half of the strand, I could actually reconstruct the entire DNA molecule by simply using this, this pairing technique. And in fact, that's what the body does when it replicates DNA, when the cells divide and you form a second, uh, second set of chromosomes. It's a very long and complex process, but it also is a process that we use when we analyze DNA. It, on a much smaller scale, we can target certain regions of the DNA, kind of divide it down the middle, replicate both halves, and we now have two sets where we only had one before. And in this way, we can take small amounts of DNA and in certain, we target certain regions of the DNA and unzip them and duplicate them and unzip them again and duplicate them, we can actually get enough of the DNA present, <coughs> excuse me, to be able to characterize that particular segment of DNA. Now, going back to the chromosomes, every, every human has 23 pairs of chromosomes. I should mention that these A's, T's, G's, and C's are the basic building blocks of DNA, not just in humans. Same basic four building blocks make up the DNA of a cow, of a cat, of a dandelion. The thing that makes it different in terms of organisms is the sequence of the A's, the T's, the G's, and the C's and the ways in which they are packaged in each of these organisms. That will determine what type of organism it is. In, in humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, of which 22 of these are what are called autosomal chromosomes. In essence, we have two copies of chromosome 1. There would be a similar type of location on each of the two copies of chromosome 1 that I have. When I get to the 23rd pair, this is called the sex determinant pair. And we have characterized that in humans as either being an X or you could have a Y. If you have two X's, you're female. If you have an X and a Y, you're male. Any other combination does not survive. That's what DNA is. Okay. How is uh, is there another diagram that explains how it's uh, how we get DNA? Or I, I do have another di uh, diagram that involves uh, inheritance. Yeah. Um, exhibit number eight sixty. <clears throat> yes, as I mentioned, uh, each of us has 23 pairs of chromosomes. If you have a, a mother and a father, when they have offspring, it becomes a, a genetic mix of the two. I mentioned that there's, there are two copies of each chromosome. Well, one will, one will come from the father and one will come from the mother. So that in generation to generation, if I take a look at one particular um, could you move that up just, just a little bit? If I take a look at uh, 
the mother here. Um, however many copies this is, it might be 10. She has, at this particular DNA location, if we were to, uh, to say that these are short tandem repeats, that there are, there's a repeat of 10 that she has on one of her chromosomes, uh, locations, and a repeat of four that she has on the other of that, or the pair of that chromosome. She could then pass the 10 or the four to her offspring. Likewise, the father at that same DNA location may have a different pair in which he has a, a two and a six. And he would pass either the two or the six onto their offspring. So that through this, you have two people at this particular DNA location, you have a possibility of four different combinations. And in, uh, in paternity testing, they, they use this, this type of information a lot to be able to determine if uh, a particular individual could be an offspring of a, a particular couple. Now, you, you said 10, for instance, the mother, and we're assuming that that's 10, maybe more. The mother's 10 and 4. Um, that's the number of repeats of that particular chain of nucleotides. Is that right? Did I say that right? That's, that's correct. Uh, and in fact, it's very, uh, very analogous to the type of, of testing that we do with regard to short tandem repeats in that we have this type of, uh, of nomenclature where we use numeric values to talk about the number of repeats that are, that are present. Okay. You, you so as a DNA analyst, um, you get an item of evidence um, that needs to be analyzed. Can you take us through the process, what you do with it, um, and how it's analyzed? Usually the items um, are, have been stored in our central property unit in the, uh, in the division, our scientific investigation division. When I receive an assignment, I then go down to, down to property, check the item out of property, and take it back to my workbench. Uh, after I've thoroughly clean my workbench and, and, and the implements, then put down a piece of paper and open the items uh, one item at a time. Uh, I take a look at them, I'll make notes of, uh, or observations of, of what is inside each package, and if I have to open the package then and examine the item, I'll make more notes. Uh, if necessary, or if I think it's pertinent, I will sample the item, uh, either taking a swab of something or cut out a portion of it, put it in a small test tube, uh, mark the test tube with information that relates it to that particular item and to the notes that I have made um, in my case file, um, package the item back up, and get it ready to go back to the, to the property division. If there are multiple items, I'll then clean my workspace, and open the next item and go through the same process. After I finish this initial process, I now have a set of test tubes that contain uh, samples that need to be examined. Uh, and I will go through a series of steps which uh, extract the DNA from, any, from the, uh, these particular uh, samples that are contained in the, in the test tubes. Uh, if I obtain a solution that I think has extracted DNA in it, I will then take a look at the uh, amount of DNA, of human DNA, that is recovered. And the kit we were using also would tell us a relative amount of, of male DNA, if in fact there's male DNA in the sample. Uh, after getting this information, uh, then a portion of this sample may then also be moved on to doing DNA typing uh, by uh, a commercial kit that we use. Uh, and this uh, DNA typing then, we took a look, we take a look at a number of DNA locations. Uh, we spoke with this particular exhibit about one location uh, that we were looking at. Uh, the, the kit that we use for DNA looks, looked at, I think it was 15 different locations at one time. 
after the data has been recovered from this DNA typing, if you would call it that, uh, the data is then reviewed to determine uh, if it is uh, interpretable, I guess uh, would be a proper word, uh, to, to see how many potential people are, are present um, and if there is enough data to be able to figure out who may or may not be present if we were to compare it to reference samples. These comparisons are, are then made and uh, results are, or, or conclusions are drawn and a report is drafted. The report then, along with all of the notes and all of the data from all of the testing, are given to a second analyst, one who was not involved in the, in the case. This is called the technical review or the peer review. Second analyst will then go through all of the notes, all of the testing, make sure that the, the right samples were looked at, make sure that they were looked at correctly, make sure that they were properly sampled, make sure that the right tests were run, make sure that the tests gave uh, proper results. In other words, the positive control that we ran on the test gave a positive expected result, that the negative control that we ran on the test gave no result at all. Uh, they will then check our interpretation of the, the DNA results and, uh, and afterward, uh, if there's any uh, discussion between the technical reviewer and the, and the analyst, they will then resolve uh, and come to some agreement as to what the data mean. And the final report will be written and, and sent out. And, and at some point in time during all this, the evidence has been taken back to, to the property unit. You mentioned a few words that we may not be familiar with. What's a kit? You said kits a few times. The, the field of forensic science is an applied science. It is one in which we take techniques that are used in other sciences and we apply them for the specialty that we have. In so doing, there are commercial or companies that provide prepared kits that will then allow us to use the kit to get uh, the desired results that we need. The kits are manufactured and used by other forensic laboratories across the nation and it is kind of a, a, a way to standardize uh, the testing that is done in the individual laboratories. The kits are designed based upon recommendations made by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, with regard to their certain genetic locations must be tested or should be tested in order to be able to participate in the DNA database that is nationwide. Um, and so when you say these kits, do they contain the chemicals that will find those areas on the, on the DNA strands? That Yes, they do. They contain uh, all of the necessary uh, solutions, uh, what are called buffers, what are called primers, what are called internal controls. Um, those are all contained in these kits. You must put them together in certain proportions and then add the DNA that you extracted from your particular uh, case sample and then process it through a, it's called a, a thermal cycler, which will, it's called amplify the DNA at those uh, various targeted DNA regions, allowing us to get enough information at each of those DNA regions, potentially, to be able to get some sort of DNA results on a subsequent uh, instrument that we use, and be able to do a final interpretation of the DNA typing that is present. Okay. And the amplification process, is that like what you described when you were standing here in front where it unzips and then reconnects so that it multiplies? Yes, it is. Uh, it, the amplification process is called the, the polymerase chain reaction. Uh, it's a, <coughs> excuse me, a process that uh, uses a, an enzyme called a polymerase, 
which can reconstruct the DNA. If you recall, I mentioned it, it, the DNA can unzip and be rebuilt. The polymerase is what does the rebuilding. It, it is an enzyme that's present in the kits, along with the individual building blocks. And the enzyme will then start at one end uh, with the as no, uh, noted by what's called a, a primer, which has been designated for a particular DNA location, will move down the strand of DNA and take the appropriate A, G, T, or C building block and add it to this half a strand of DNA to, go, to make a whole strand. And it does that with both halves. And that, that's one cycle. It then goes to the second cycle, and in the second cycle, both of the strands that were made will be split, and from those two, you will make four. And it's, it's kind of a, a it's called an exponential increasing um, process. It, it's, it's very much similar to the, to the analogy that if I took one penny, set it aside, and then the next day, and each subsequent day after that, I double what I have. So the second day, I would put a second penny down. The third day, well, I've got two, I put two more down. The next day, well, I've got four, well, I put four down. 28 days, $1 million. It's amazing how fast it amplifies. We run these kits, this polymerase chain reaction, for 28 or 29 cycles. So we have the potential at each of these DNA locations to copy that particular bit of information a million times. It's kind of like looking at a needle that's in a haystack and finding a magic way of going in and finding the needle, multiplying the needle, and now you have a haystack of needles. That's get that amount of, of DNA out. And with that amount of DNA, we are then able to do some sort of typing and understand the information that is contained at that DNA location. Is there some, before you do that amplification process, you look at the amount of DNA that's in the sample? Yes, sir. We, we need to understand how much human DNA is present in the sample. Um, the reason I make that distinction is, uh, as I mentioned before, there is DNA present in all life forms. And so, uh, and a lot of the samples that we deal with have bacteria in them. Well, bacteria have DNA. So we want to make sure that if we just use a, a generic uh, test to determine how much DNA we have, which we used to do, it may not give us how much human DNA we have. The kits that I spoke of rely on a, an amount of DNA to be put into them in order for them to optimize their uh, ability to succeed in, in manufacturing or multiplying the, the DNA. And so therefore, we measure how much human DNA is present in the sample and then either concentrate it or dilute it to be able to put the appropriate amount of DNA in each of these uh, through this, this test kit. Does it always work? In other words, can you have some DNA, you try to amplify it, and the amplification doesn't work, or you don't get good results? It does not always work. That can be for a, a number of reasons, uh, not the least of which is there was no DNA in the sample. Um, there are other times that there is, there's something in the DNA or in the sample, it's not necessarily in the DNA, but something in there that interferes with that polymerase uh, and the processing of that polymerase. Uh, there actually is a, um, in the kit that we use for determining how much human DNA is present, there actually is a, a built-in mechanism for determining if this inhibition takes place in each sample. Uh, and that is one of the things that we check uh, every time that we do a, a DNA quantitation is we check, was this polymerase chain reaction inhibited at all? If it's not inhibited, then we can trust the quantitation values that we got. 
If it was inhibited, we have a couple of options. One is to compensate for that. The better one is to try and get rid of the inhibitor. And there are a couple of processes by which we can try and get rid of the inhibitor and then retest it, trying to determine how much human DNA is present. You also mentioned a couple other terms, a, a positive and a negative. Can you explain those? Yes, as with, uh, as with any scientific test that you do, you should always run a, a positive control and a negative control to make sure that the test itself works. Uh, each of the samples that I'm running for the evidence is on, I really don't know if there's DNA there or not. But if I run a sample that I know has DNA in it, and I know I run a sample that does not have DNA in it, if the positive control gives me an expected value, and the negative control gives me zero, then I can be sure, number one, the process worked, and number two, there's no contamination in the reagents that I used in the test. Pretty much every test that we run has a positive control and a negative control for us to be able to rely on the results that we get from that test. Now, we were talking about uh, you running a test on an item or, or a particular sample and you get results. What do those results look like? How does that work? What, what kind of results do you get? If you're talking about the final DNA results? Well, you put it into a machine, I take it, right? What kind of, what kind of machine is it's, it? It's, it seems as though we put everything into a machine. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, after the DNA has been, after we determine how much human DNA is present in a particular sample, and then take a portion of that concentrated and put that in our amplification kit, which will then look for these 15 DNA locations and multiply the information at those locations. That particular amplified product then goes into an instrument, which will then tell us information about those specific 15 DNA locations that we were interested in. It, will, it can be visualized in terms of a chart. It's called an electropherogram. Pretty much it's a, a chart that will show you relatively how much of these repeats are present at each DNA location and how many different types, uh, what are called alleles, you have. When I spoke with regard to this particular uh, exhibit, each of these variants is called an allele for that particular DNA location. And each location will have a, basically a range of variability. Maybe they have between 2 and 16 repeats. At another DNA location, it may have between 18 and 25 repeats. And so each of these repeats, the number is used to designate the allele. This electropherogram will then tell us the number of a repeat that seems to be in high uh, quantity or a number of alleles that are present in high quantity in a particular sample. And allow us to determine how many individuals are represented by the DNA in that sample, and perhaps what the different DNA combinations are that are present for those, for those particular individuals. We'll start with um, something relatively easy, I guess. What's a, what's a reference sample? A reference sample is a known DNA sample from an individual. Many times when we are doing the testing of the evidence, at the end, after we have looked at the evidence and what, um, what the results are, we will then compare those results 
two reference samples that we get from individuals that will help us interpret whether they may or may not have contributed, uh, or could or could not have contributed DNA to that particular sample. Each reference sample at each DNA location should have a maximum of two alleles. It may be a particular individual at a location has the same variant on both copies of their chromosome. So in this instance, with a, what was this exhibit number again? 83? Oh, uh, yeah, that's the tough question. 860. Thank you. On exhibit 860, the mother has a 10 4. If the second one was not a 4, if it was a also a 10, which is a possibility, then she would be characterized simply by one peak it would be a 10. Right now, for this particular exhibit, at this particular location, she would be characterized as a 10-4. She would have two peaks. Okay. I'm going to show you exhibit. Well, in this case, did you receive a reference sample that was identified to you as a buccal swab belonging to Charles Merritt? Yes, sir, I did. And was that labeled by the lab item F-46? Yes, sir. Let me show you exhibit 859. And I'll scroll down. Can you tell us what this is, please? This is a copy of a page of my notes. Uh, it involves sample F-46, which as you have mentioned is the, uh, the reference DNA sample from uh, uh, Mr. Merritt. Each of these panels across here has particular DNA locations designated in a kind of a shaded bar at the top of the panel. I'm going to try to zoom in so you can read it. This first one in the in the first line, D8S1179. This is a particular DNA location. It's number D meaning it's for DNA. Eight means it's on chromosome number eight. S means that it's single copy. You will not find this particular type of sequence anywhere else in the human genome. So it's a single copy, which is really important for forensic scientists. And then 1179 is simply on chromosome number 8. It's the 1179th area that was characterized on that, that particular chromosome. And this is a, a classic way of designating many of the markers that we look at. There are a couple of others on here that are classified because they have a certain relationship or are close to parts of the DNA that actually code for a particular protein. And therefore, rather than having a, a D something S number, they will actually have a, another set of, of, of characters that define that particular DNA location. So, so when we take a look at we can go back up to D8. When we take a look at D8, we see that there are two recognized alleles at this DNA location, an 8 and an 11. At this particular location, D2, 8, I'm sorry, D8, uh, S, 1179, Mr. Merritt would be characterized as an 8, 11. Take a look at the next one over on this particular exhibit. It says D21, S11. At this particular location, again, he has two alleles. This time characterized by a 28 and a 32.2. 
I should mention, it says 38, 32.2. And it means that there's a repeat and a half. The point two means that there's a half in there. These, each of these repeats are four base pairs long. So if it has a whole number, it has all four. Somewhere in this repeat unit, one of these repeats only has two of the nucleotides present. This is a common thing that happens at a number of the DNA locations. The next one, D7S820. And this one characterized as a, an 8, 9, and so forth. And this is, this is how it progresses through the, uh, through the electropharograms. The last one actually is one of those that I, I spoke of that is characterized more by a, uh, a protein that is found in Eric or a, a, an actual gene that is found in Eric, CSF1PO. This particular one is characterized as a, a 10, 12. There are uh, 15 of these as we go through. And if you get down to one more, maybe two more. This one is at the, at the bottom of this particular page on the left-hand side. At the top, uh, if this box were a little bit wider, we'd say AMEL for amylogenin. Amylogenin is what we call the sex determinant marker. This particular one, Mr. Merritt has explained earlier and should have, an X and a Y. This designates this as a male. When we take a look overall at this particular profile, if we did not know that this was a reference sample, each of the genetic location that is here has either one or two potential alleles. They are all roughly about the same size. This particular result is consistent with a single source DNA sample. Basically, the, the DNA came from a single individual. Uh, all reference sam samples should show this. When you get to taking a look at evidential samples, you take a look at different patterns. The number of alleles at a particular DNA location and you can start to make some inferences with regard to the number of people that may have contributed to that DNA mixture. I see other tiny peaks there on this electropharogram. Yes, you will. Um, uh, not so much the shaded triangles, those are, uh, are different, but with each large amplified peak, a lot of times there is a smaller peak that is exactly one unit smaller. So this particular one where we're looking at D5S818, there is an allele called an 11, but if you look slightly to the left of it, there's a small, a small peak right there. Also with the other allele, which is here, which I believe is a 13. If you move down just a little bit, we can see if that's a, is a 13. You see that, again, there's a small peak that is there. This is a, a known artifact of the process that we use. This is, particular peak is called a stutter, and is generally, it's one unit one repeat unit smaller than the major allele that it represents. This is a, uh, as I say, it's, it's a known feature of the technology that we use, and therefore we have to be aware of it, and we have to take a look and have an understanding of how high that peak would be if in fact it was a true allele that is present. In this instance, it is consistent with stutter, which we expect for this particular technology. 
and therefore it is not determined to be a, an allele. It is a, basically for lack of a better term, a technology artifact. Uh, this is another function that we need to be aware of when we are taking a look at the resulting interpreted. Uh, because of this, <clears throat> because of the complexity of the technology, before we put any of this into work or into play in the crime laboratory, we need to go through validation studies of these particular kits that we were uh, speaking of. And these validation studies run reference samples, they run mixtures, they run known um, or, well, previously characterized evidential samples. They run lots of blanks. Uh, we do a lot of things to, to determine stutter, and therefore we set what we call stutter filters. We also try to determine when you have a, a genetic lo a, a location here, you notice these peaks are not exactly the same. They're not exactly the same height. We need to study and find out how close we expect these things to be to each other if they, in fact, came from the same individual. It's called like a peak height ratio. And there are several other uh, other features that we have to uh, have to look at during validation studies in order to be able to understand how the system works, understand its limitations, and be able to properly incorporate these into the interpretation that we make of the data that we get from the kit and from the instrument. Okay, so on, on this, we've kind of gone and shown the peaks there along the uh, x-axis. What does the y-axis represent? The y-axis kind of represents the, the strength or the amount of DNA that is there. The, the reading that is made by the instrument uh, is based on a fluorescence. Uh, when I mentioned before that the, the DNA is multiplied in each of these repetitive cycles, this polymerase chain reaction, there's a starting block called a primer that identifies the DNA location. And these primers are labeled with fluorescent tags. So that at the end, when you have all of these DNA fragments, each one of them has a fluorescent tag on it. And all of the ones at a particular DNA location will have the same color tag. And in fact, if you go across this row, each of these DNA locations has the same colored fluorescent tag. It will be different from the series or the panel above it. So this represents four different colors, because there are four lines in this, I believe there's four, um, four different colored fluorescent tags. So when the DNA flows through the instrument and comes across, there's, there's a, a laser that then activates the fluorescence, and the fluorescence is measured. And these are called, the height here is uh, relative fluorescence units. So it is a kind of a measure as to how much of that particular allele is present. It is a, a, a relative, uh, relative abundance or relative count to give you how strong the signal is. Okay, is that, so the numbers are different as you go down or, or across the, the chart, is that right? So in other words, this is 400, 800, 1,200, or are they different? Yeah. 500, 1,000, 1,500. Right, there are, there are different scales. What this particular um, plotting program does is it kind of, kind of maximizes and then runs the scale to the height of the, the highest peak that's on there. The, <clears throat> the assumption is that the amount, or the relative amounts of DNA that are here are then the 
reflective of the relative amounts of DNA that were present in the original extract, in the original sample. So that if I have a lot of DNA, uh, I would get a, a lower fluorescence unit count. Is there a level of fluorescent units at which um, you either call an allele, say an allele is present, or say it isn't present? Uh, yes, sir. This, again, is, is part of that validation study that we um, that we perform. I, I mentioned that we do, uh, we run a number of blank samples. When you run blank samples and you take a look at charts like this, the scale may go from 0 to, let's say, 30 or less. Why is that? Because there are no because the, this is looking for whatever the highest peaks are that are there. If there's no sign that it's not really flat, there are lots, lots of bumps and wiggles. It's kind of like looking at something really close. It's a lot of, we, we would call it grass, but it's, it's, it's noise. Again, this is another technology-related artifact that we need to account for. And one of the things that we do in a validation study is to understand pretty much how strong a signal needs to be in order to differentiate it from the background noise that will be present on the instrument. And this is called an analytical threshold. So if we, and in fact, in, in our laboratory, we establish an analytical threshold of 50 RFUs. So if if a particular peak rises above 50, it will be recognized as a, a bona fide DNA allele. If it does not, then it is it is not recorded. If the peak does not above it, it's not recognized as a bona fide DNA allele. Um, <clears throat> does every you said validation studies. I take it those are probably required to be accredited. They're, well, they're required to be accredited. They're also required to be prior to you implementing the technology in your laboratory. Um, so you have to know what what the noise is made or what the noise the machine is making on a blank sample in order to accurately call. In order to to understand when you actually get a, a sample through that has true DNA in it. Uh, how to get, especially if it has a low level of DNA. Uh, it's, it's the low level samples that are, uh, can be, uh, can be questionable. And when I say low level, it doesn't mean that the entire sample is low level. It may be that a particular contributor is a low level contributor. And in order to be able to um, properly identify alleles that they may have contributed, you have to understand what is machine noise and what is a valid allele. And the validation studies assist us in doing that. Let me uh, interrupt you for at this point. We'll go ahead and take our morning recess at this time, 15 minutes. Keep in mind uh, the admissions previously given to you, not to form or express any opinions about the case, not to discuss the case, and we'll see everyone back in about 20 minutes.